Midwest fertilizer runoff adding to low oxygen in the Gulf of Mexico. The U.S. needs a national strategy for regulating farm pollution. Experts are saying changing attitudes is key. A below average Gulf of Mexico dead zone measured. Illinois agriculture continues to battle nutrient pollution. Most of the farmers that are still farming today are here because they changed somehow. No one who was farming today was farming exactly like they did 50 years ago. So I think farmers are very adaptable to change because they know that in order to survive in this industry, you've got to continue to assess your operation year in and year out. Dad and I farm 3,000 acres of corn and soybeans. Let's see, it's been probably at least a handful of years now where Dad is still uh, actively involved in the operation, both uh, with the work and financially, but uh, all the decision making as far as what happens on a day-to-day -day basis and where things go and what things happen uh, is my responsibility at this point. One of the th hardships that many farm operations have is the father-son transition. My goal has been to facilitate him to be successful, and because of that, I've watched a young man who has been able to instigate his own ideas, create his own parameters on things. I probably couldn't have asked for a better grandfather to, to grow up around. He created a tone in this operation to not be afraid to try something new if you think it can make a difference. Came here, my wife and I, 1st of March, 1951. Well, I was on the board of the Soil Conservation District. I realized that I was just losing too much soil or there was too much of it leaving this farm. And I, I'm a firm believer that when you lose soil, you lose the best you got. I'm very, very much pleased to see the adaptation of so much soil saving techniques in the farming community nowadays. Our goal is always to leave something better than the way we got it, whether it's you know something we've had for a really long time or something that or a farm that maybe we've just picked up. And I think a lot of it really has to do with on my side of it is, you know, I spent a lot of time with my dad and, and my grandfather when I was younger because, you know, I grew up out here on the farm. I mean, Michael grew up riding with my father in the combine before there was the extra seat and can remember pulling the lever for unloading the grain. It seemed more enjoyable when I was a kid than I am now at times because you realize that when you're the guy that has to make the decisions and you, you realize the financial implications that come with some of the decisions you make, uh, it does make, you know, it does make this job more challenging. When my dad was my age and particularly younger, when he first took over the operation, you know, they had some really hard financial years just based on, you know, the weather and not having crops and whatnot. We applied for FHA loans in those days and our interest rates were running 11 to 13 percent. In 1985, a woman asked us to farm uh, another uh, 280 acres, so we had to come up with the funds to do that and at the same time uh, start to buy the equipment. They're again paying these interest rates and stuff. 1988, we had the most severe drought that I think we'd seen since the 30s. Some of the things that he had to go through to get to where he is at today actually gave, gave me a lot of respect for who he is and who he is for a farmer too because I don't, I don't think I could survive what he went through at my age. Winter, I had to submit a negative cash flow. The only time I've ever submitted a cash flow that turned out negative and you wondered whether the bank was gonna lend you money. Those were years that you better have um, some pretty good stamina. I never realized how hard it really was when I was a kid because dad just came home and he was dad. You know, he wasn't, he wasn't the guy that was, sorry. 
Oh. He didn't bring that stress home with him. There's going to be adversity, and that's okay. Even with the stresses, it's still what I wanted to do, and I have the, the fortune to be around a lot of really sharp people who allow me the rope to try things, be innovative. So at the end of the day, that's, that's the way I feel about it. You can endure a lot if you like what you're doing. I have been at Illinois Farm Bureau for about nine years. I am the Director of Environmental Policy, but I spend most of my time working with regulatory agencies. And so that's either at the federal level, USDA, US EPA, or at the state level, same kind of thing. Uh, Illinois EPA, Illinois Department of Ag, and any others that, that would touch on environmental issues in agriculture. The Illinois Farm Bureau is a farmer-led grassroots organization. So a farmer would join our organization through their local county farm bureau. They can come up with ideas and say, this is an issue in my county and this is what I think um, the solution should be as far as law or regulation. There's a lot of ways for people to either get together socially or start to engage in I think very impactful ways um, to really protect, defend, and be very thoughtful about what this, what this industry needs to look like in the future. And I think Illinois Farm Bureau is that venue for making that happen. The Illinois Nutrient Loss Reduction Strategy has become a thing in and of itself back uh, when we started going to meetings in 2013. So this was about day two on the job for me. Hey, Lauren, you know, you, you need to go to the Illinois EPA. They're having a meeting on fertilizer and manure runoff. You know, will you be the Illinois Farm Bureau representative? Yeah, I will. The federal EPA had actually issued a guidance memo. So not a law, not a regulation, but a guidance memo that said we want states to put together these strategies to kind of build off of whatever you have going on and add to it. But we were around the table with all of the ag groups, environmental groups, wastewater treatment community, academia. By the end of it, we agreed to a strategy and agriculture actually had a really great opportunity to continue to think about this issue and address the issue in a voluntary way. So yes, we had to admit we do contribute quite a bit of nitrate nitrogen into our water and we do contribute a bit of phosphorus with the sediment that enters into our waterway. Effectively, the Illinois NLRS, it sets targets for us to reduce the losses of nitrate, nitrogen, and total phosphorus. They are two critical nutrients for all forms of life, and that also includes crops. It's also the most common fertilizer nutrients being added into farmlands for crop production. The land may take fertilizer more than it can be consumed by plants, and then a lot of that will be uh, flushed by runoff or leached in the field, in the soil. And then these flushed off part as well as the leached part will go into the water body. Locally, that could be the creek, the ditch, but eventually they'll, they'll work their way down the Mississippi and into the Gulf of Mexico. You're looking at probably two thirds of the continental U.S. plus uh, a couple of provinces in Canada that drain our way. And the issue is what's referred to as the hypoxic zone or the dead zone. And that's where nutrient rich waters because of the nitrogen and phosphorus in particular accumulate. Whereas you will have algae blooms because of the nutrient enriched water uh, that are formed. And as these algae blooms die off, they deplete the oxygen in the water where they're located. And that creates a potential problem for uh, the habitat for fish that are located wherever this hypoxic zone occurs. Also, you know, on the farming side of things, you know, we're, we're losing nutrients that we could potentially utilize too. So that could long-term, you know, affect our economic uh, viability out here too, because you might be, you know, you, you could argue you're spending more on fertilizer, but more so, uh, I, I just think that you're just affecting how the ground is, is gonna produce because, you know, Grandpa always talks about the soil that you have on top is the best you have, and when it washes away, you've lost the best you have. So we wanna 
do as much as we can to keep soil, you know, on our own farms. We have these goals that are out there, these targets that we're shooting for, but they are um, five year running averages because the, it can rain a lot and we have a lot of flow or it can be a drought and we have very little, which will impact the amount of nitrate and phosphorus that we have in the water. Also, we're subject to hurricanes in our part of the world. And these type of storms have a tendency to stir the bottom. And that in itself reduces the size of the epoxic zone. There's no consistency in the size of what that zone is going to be. You had lawsuits attempted in uh, the federal court system down in Louisiana where environmental groups said, US EPA, we think you should do something to, to regulate how we can address this. In that case, the answer was you should make every state um, do numeric standards, so water quality standards for nitrate and for phosphorus. So far, even through the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and now the Biden administration, we have different versions of those memos that I talked about that say, nah, we want to lean into these states kind of taking the lead here and, and putting these strategies to work on the ground. There's two major types of nutrient loss reduction practices. So we're reducing losses. And they can be thought of as being infield or edge of field. So the infield would be, as the name might imply, what a farmer's doing with their field. And these are things like reduced tillage or conservation tillage. There are things like cover cropping. And then you've got edge of field. These include things like bioreactors or buffer strips or even small wetlands that can help mitigate the transfer of nitrate into waterways. Conservation practices that we are implementing on this farm today are no-till, strip-till, uh, banding our fertilizer, uh, variable rating our fertilizer, buffer strips, to catch nutrients. We have terraces to help control water flow. We've implemented pattern tile draining systems to help for water infiltration to prevent runoff. We have a wood chip bioreactor on our farm as well, another conservation practice. So I mean, we're implementing every type of strategy that you can think about to try to do better than what we were doing you know, previously. The first thing you have to understand, and, and I think most people do nowadays, or maybe they don't, that the, the soil is it's the beginning of everything. I'd offer up the idea that soils are the skin of the earth. And if you think of an apple, the peel of the apple, that thin peel, is roughly, roughly analogously the thickness of the soil that supports, by the way, all life on the terrestrial planet. I, I probably say this a lot <laughs> in these interviews, but my grandpa always, he had this friend that used to say, you know, if it washes away, don't worry, there's more under that. And you can't think that way. You know, when, when you're losing that top layer, that peel, as you call it, you know, you're losing the best you got. And that's just going down the river and creating a lot of, a lot of issues. And that's, that is why we have been so focused on our farm doing these kind of things, because we know that if we don't implement some of these strategies, that we're gonna lose the soil because of the kind of terrain and the kind of soil that we farm. In most cropping systems, historically at least, we've unfortunately been eroding faster than what the soil can naturally replenish from bedrock. A lot of consumers, unfortunately, hear a very simple story of nutrient losses are from over-application of fertilizers. It's more complicated than that. And that message has to get out there, as does the science. A good example here is phosphorus. Most of our phosphorus is lost by erosion of soil, not by fertilizer. Our mission is really to do the most advanced science in this topic, but at the same time, also put sufficient effort to translate this research to be actionable items and practical implications. You actually want to make it relevant. And then how to bring that relevance into a research? Then you've got to talk to your stakeholders. And then our biggest the stakeholder are farmers. You know, this problem of nutrient loss was not created over one year, and it's not gonna be fixed in one year. It was created over a very long uh, stretch of time. And so it's gonna take, it's probably gonna take time to fix it as well. And that's, that's what we're trying to do out here, is we're trying to, you're trying to implement these strategies and try to implement it over a longer scale to make that difference in what's happening.